Hello everyone, this is Soren, your chess friend. Sometimes I might be your chess tutor, sometimes I might be your chess student because these conditions are interchangeable. We always learn from each other and my main advice would always be to just sharing the best of our ideas so that we can grow together. I want to propose to you today guys a game considered the match of the century. Now, mind you, that was happening in the 20th century. I'm talking about 1972. Now we are in the 21st century. So, you know, the last century, match of the game of the last century. Okay, probably you might already have an idea. It is about the white Boris Vasilievich Spassky for white and black Robert James Fisher, the World Chess Championship that happened in 1972 that culminated with Bobby becoming world champion right so i have opted for the 30th game in their struggle and we're going to discuss this now about the game analysis it could last for 10 minutes if you're incredibly fast and you like kind of omit a couple of ideas it could be like for half an hour it could be one hour hey it could be two hours it could be for days so we can't stay for days analyzing continuously running commentary so we'll just have to encapsulate whatever meaningful can be said about this wonderful game i'm going to try and share as much of the ideas as i can and if i skip some of those pardon me guys uh leave it in the messages tell me look i think you missed this you missed that you should have said this you should have said that no problem i thank you for your feedback so now let's just get straight to this game okay so are you seeing uh my board here i think you do let me just check one more time apologies for this yeah i think you should yeah okay so uh let me flip the board just uh to seeing black's perspective because i want to talk about the alakine defense today or i think if you want to use it the original russian language would be alerhin defense the pronunciation or alehin right so we're going now e4 knight f6 uh, e5 directly attacking the knight if it ever happens guys i'm just addressing now my younger students um don't go back on uh, g8 where the knight was initially okay just try and keep your knights in the center and if you're further harassed by either bishop or the pawn just get the get the knight on b6 okay don't move back where they were not advisable you never want to get the pieces back where they started from you actually get, want to activate them continuously going so knight to d5 d4 has been played d6 now because black simply wants to undermine the pawn structure that want uh, that white wants to build up in the center so you want to undermine that you want to attack that knight f3 of course again bishop c4 c4 could have been playable as well g6 that already that already means the bishop will be developed on g7 not, uh, bishop c4 attacking now you can play move that defense and attacks simultaneously uh knight to b6 the bishop has to respond bishop b3 maintaining this diagonal very important in case you're playing whites you 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 ever choose to play this line now for white boris played uh knight to d2 not a bad one it's a theoretical move you could do it uh probably the most aggressive response that uh for white here would be knight to g5 knight to g5 because guys you are provoking black you know you actually determine them to respond because uh we've got the knight on f7 or the bishop to f7 so you, when you play knight g5 you are forcing black to do something probably e6 probably castle on the king side but they need to react to your move so knight g5 might have been the most aggressive line anyway knight to d2 also previously white could have castled their king by the way if i forgot to mention this h3 has been played by boris paski here um probably with the purpose of not allowing the bishop to make a pen and implicitly you know giving some headaches to white although it might be considered mild move a little bit of a time a tempo wasted by the way tempo comes from the latin time my younger students and it means in chess to losing like a turn giving your opponent the uh, advantage to take initiative and play another developing move a5 you could see now uh, my chess friends that a5 simply wants to play a4 and to give some trouble to their bishop so a4 has been played very naturally here taking the center 
and takes in the center. Now we can say that black has developed uh, the king side. The, uh, the the king is safe. They've castled. They only need to find ways to getting the uh, knight on b8 and the bishop on c8. Those two pieces need to be developed. So now they play knight a6. I know some of you might say, wait a second, why would I get the knight on a6 where I could have just gotten the knight on c6? That's true. But tactically, if you can just take it one step further and just imagine that if the knight were to make it on c5, you will have a double attack on a4. Plus that coupled up with either the bishop or the queen, you might have the chance to just grab an extra pawn from your opponent. And Bobby tries to, you know, being very accurate and aggressive. So knight to c5 now, attacking b3 and attacking the uh, uh, pawn on a4. Queen plays on e2. Now queen to e8. So we've got I think three consequences, at least three good consequences here for Black in this very position, for Bobby Fisher or Robert James Fisher, the full name. So now Black is attacking once, twice, thrice, including the Queen on E8. Another good idea. The Queen moved away from the D uh, from the D file, where probably uh, White might be placing a rook. And another idea: when this guy on D2 goes away, the Bishop that goes on G5 will no longer pin the pawn to the Queen. So these are all ideas. Right, so knight goes in the middle on e4, challenging already this guy. <clears throat> so now he took a knight on b6, takes the extra pawn. So now Bobby is one pawn up. Bishop takes, knight takes. And now the other rook goes on e1 to more cementing a possible pawn's advancement, getting the rook here uh, on the e file. Probably the other rook wants to go on the d file as well. Bishop had to be developed too. And also, if I forgot to mention, also the bishop and the rook attack twice on a5. So uh, Spassky here developed the minor piece from the back row and also attacks the a5. You see, so now white, uh, sorry, black needs to do something about that pawn. So Bobby chose to play a4. Now, bishop to g5, but happily now for black, there is no problem with this pawn being pinned by the, you know, uh, because the queen has been moved from d8 over to e8. There's no problem about pushing the pawn or moving the queen freely if needed to. h6, challenging the bishop, goes on h4. Bishop now on a5, simply developing and attacking. You can't keep your pieces on the back rank. Either white or black, you've got to get all of your pieces as fast as possible into the fray so you don't want to keep them undeveloped boys and girls especially for younger students because the intermediate and advanced ones already know this trick it's not a trick it's common knowledge it's universal knowledge you've got to develop your pieces very i can't stress how important that is by chess friends so g4 now mm, a little bit double-edged sword i mean it attacks the bishop uh it forces them to take a decision hey you're gonna take my knight you're gonna run away what do you want to do Okay, and also it kind of weakens the king's side, if we may say that. <clears throat> bishop e6, uh, knight to d4, attacking the bishop. Now, when Bobby played bishop e6, I'm 100% certain that he already thought about the cooperation in between the bishop on e6 and knight on b6 and c4 square, because his next move is bishop c4, attacking queen, bishop being developed, uh, sorry, defended by the knight and also there is some attack on the pawn on e5 well it's a direct attack actually the bishop attacks the pawn right so queen had to move away the engine suggests here that the bishop should take on e5 bobby chose to play queen to d7 okay they're already on the same file with the uh, queen okay so probably black wants to get the rook on the d file that's exactly what Boris did. So I think I told you like a few moves ago that the idea is for white to get the rooks on the central files and alike for black. You want to get your rooks on the E and D columns respectively. F4. So now Spassky comes down with those pawns. Very dangerous. They will be moving uh, uh, down further, attacking, attacking. Uh, Bishop now plays on D5. Knight attacks the queen, obviously. You gotta move the queen to safety. You move the queen to safety and preserve the b7 a bit more. Maybe if you want to move that bishop away from the diagonal, you gotta keep an eye on the b7 pawn. And the queen just does that. Queen plays on c3, cementing the bishop here. So the pawn now defends the bishop. 
no problem. Also, black needs to be very mindful about a very dangerous diagonal with the bishop. Queen moves on h2, probably allowing the circulation, the free circulation of the rooks. So to being unhindered, you know, so you want to let a lot of space for yourselves here. Knight plays on d3, c5 now attacking the knight, the knight and the queen defends c5, so that's very nice. Knight goes back because now Boris uh, says, look, once you push the pawn, I can get my knight very nicely on d6, and that will be a heck of an outpost and a little bit of a headache for black here because, uh, look, you got to move the queen or you get forked next move. So he does play queen to c6, which makes a battery with the bishop on d5. Nine now plays on d6, attacking the rook. Now, I will just pause it for a second, guys, because there is a little bit of a tactic here. Most of us, um, quite certain most of us probably would think about moving the rook now, saving the rook. Oh, where do I move the rook? What do I do? Do I go on f8? Where do I go? On b8 or something. But if you, if you give it some extra time, probably you would be able to notice that the bishop on g7 is on the same diagonal with the queen on c3. Only this guy stands in uh, front of the uh, bishop, the black bishop, to capture the white queen. And also, if you notice that the uh, black queen on c6, if it were to capture the knight, then the bishop happily takes the queen back, whilst exerting attack on the rook on e1. So, Bobby, boom, because it was a very aggressive player anyways, which is, by the way, the only right way to play chess. Queen takes d6. Pawn takes, and now bishop recovers queen, attacking the rook, and they had to take. Now white is having two double pawns on the c-file, okay? Uh, that's a weakness. In chess, when you have double pawns, it's not something to be envied. It is a problem. Right, f6 now. Probably Fisher said here, look, I just got to stop that bishop, that menacing bishop controlling the d8, h4, dark square. So I got to play f6 and stop this from happening. Now, he tries to open up because obviously now white wants to open to keep the bishop open. So that's the reason he pushed the pawn. He chose to push the g5, takes with h, takes with f, and pushes. Another thing for us guys to deepen and understand. Um, by taking on g5, we're actually contributing to losing the game if you are to having blacks here. You don't want to open your opponent's bishops. You don't want that. You want to keep it as blocked as possible, and you want to make this bishop becoming a pawn. And the only way to do that is to push it forwards. I know that comes with another consequence. You did block the bishop, true, and at the same time, you're giving white the e5 square for the, knight, for the white knight. So, you see, in chess, you can't have them all. In rare occasions, you might be able to tick all the boxes and play perfectly, blocking all your opponent's pieces and uh, some rare occasions but you can't you know have a perfect situations on chess especially if the other guy is equally stronger if not stronger so yeah <clears throat> now bishop had absolutely no game and no future so probably that was the reason they chose to uh, drop the bishop on g3 king goes on f7 you want to centralize the kings towards the end of the game kings need to also themselves contribute to the war effort so knight now checks and also forks. You can't just let that happen. So you've got to take uh, because you couldn't have moved the king closer. So now the bishop took and also very dangerously. I mean, look at this. I mean, this bishop is quite monstrous for black if you want to look at it. Uh, quite dangerous guy here. What, uh, black is still one pawn up. Another good stuff for black, this guy is a free pawn so that's another headache for white not mentioning there is a bishop here so from black's perspective that's that's a key piece the bishop on d5 okay stopping the cooperation in between the rook and this idle pawn that might want to go down the board and promote and also supports the pawn's advancement perhaps a3 perhaps a2 hey you never know so white needs to be careful about that one and black needs to pay attention to this bishop that if they go to f6 you know Exactly the same thing, so to speak. Just that they do not have the rook support for that particular pawn. Okay? Right, let's move in. Uh, so, the only game in town now is b5 and try to, you know, calm down with your pawns and hopefully you will be able to get a queen. Which he will be able to at the end. Now, Bobby plays something. 
very creative here. He got uh, he does something like rook h8. The engine suggests here rook e to d8, rook g8, rook a7. You know to double up here and things. Uh, he played something uh, like rook h8, probably. You know, from a human perspective here, giving the rook, getting rid of that bishop forever. And he said, look, that's quite strong there. You can't do nothing to move my bishop on the side. So he was very happy to give that rook to Boris Paske and, um, you know, retain just the rook and the pawn majority on the queen side. And based on the fact that the bishop on d5 would stay there pretty much like forever. So, yeah. He chose to play this. Now, he kind of lost the advantage. Not too much, though. Still, the engine gives black uh, minus like 170 something at this point in the game. A3 went down. Rook played on F4. <clears throat> Rook played on F3 probably because of this kind of ideas. So look at the danger of this pawn. Look how dangerous that pawn on a2 is. That passed pawn, free pawn, really, really dangerous. Now, white also, when they play the rook f4, they've also thought about the possibility of rook supporting that pawn a bit. Uh, bishop tooks now. I wonder if the pawn can take there. I think there is a possibility with the pawn to take, but bishop is stronger considered by the engine, by the analysts later on. I'm still recording, guys. Thank you. So bishop took, uh, the other guy goes go, goes scaringly down. Now I mean that's that's pretty intense. So the only way for 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 black would be probably what to get the bishop back on d5, or to push e5 or bishop e2 attacking or rook a to g8. It's really so. I mean, look, being a human, the most natural. I mean, the immediate response to this nightmare of a possibility of just to try and just stop the rook from controlling the d file you know so now rook comes in with check probably the uh, he thought look if there's anything i'll just get the rook back on a8 and he does that so now it's becoming again difficult for white to play so both players just to tell you guys both players uh, have been analyzed by the stockfish and by the recent engines now and apparently look it was like 80 percent accuracy for both of them with like four blunders for a player six blunders i think for white four for black so even at that super level uh, being a human you are prone to errors and mistakes and blunders so after all we're human so check, oh, by the way, if you wonder why did white push the e5, for many reasons, first and immediate one being you want to move the king out of check or you will be in serious trouble uh, because of the checks and because the rook h8 and yeah, it's a mess. So king goes away now, takes the pawn on e5, white, black took on c3, uh, check and, you know, more support for that pawn. King goes away, check, uh, takes... Now king uh, moves on c6, check again, moves away, check again, goes in front of the black rook, a bit maybe uncomfortable, takes, takes, rook, uh, sorry, pawn goes forwards here. King plays on b4. Again, the only thing for black is just to really pushing those guys. So now the white rook on e1 guys will always have to practically try and stay there and, 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 and stop the pawn. Although they do have that bishop, we got to say. So that bishop always keeps an eye, but it's a little bit problematic for white. Pawn takes. Uh, pawn comes down. Now, obviously, white really, really wants to create some counter threat there. The other pawn goes forwards. Uh, goes again the pawn really tries to just uh, sorry the uh, bishop really tries to just get on f8 i suspect so the pawn needs uh, the rook comes in front of the uh, pawn threatening to take and now spassky plays something very nice bishop to f8 now that's a little bit uncomfortable for black i mean in terms that the black rook can't do nothing unless he wants to sacrifice itself in which case it's a disaster because the pawn defending the bishop becomes the queen and i think black is finished here um, on the other hand, the engine still gives black 
uh, uh, advantage here, like minus 170 something. And uh, there is also the real prospect of those guys coming down the boards. So White will have practically to chase two rabbits at the same time. This guy is here, super dangerous. And the other pawn, the other lone pawn on the H file, also a real, real threat. And rightfully, Bob pushes the, Bobby pushes the pawn to H2. King tries desperately to step in and, you know, stave off the, 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 the horde here of the black pawns. King wants to centralize itself and, you know, the uh, white rook tries to stop. Check. King goes on uh, C4. Uh, sorry, goes to C3 in order to capture some pawns. But once they do that, there is a serious problem for this guy going forwards. And I don't think that white can do nothing to just uh, stopping them. Queen tries to lure the rook away from the D file sacrificing itself so now king comes into play a bit more active so that was a necessary move for bobby to play to making the rook moving away from the d so that the king come forth and support perhaps the f pawn coming down the board uh the white king i mean what else can they do now the machine says it's equal the machine now will give you guys the zero perfectly balanced ending but we all know that if we are to just play this against another fellow human being i don't think it will end up in a draw looks quite not draw from a human perspective unless i don't know you concentrate a lot and uh find the best stuff but i mean that look i mean just have a look at this it just looks so not draw so white tries to push now uh to further the attack they were hoping for rook takes <coughs> And then maybe the, uh, uh, maybe the rook comes down and, you know, defends against that pawn's advancement. Now the king defends. Very nice. The king now supports the pawn. You don't want to do anything with that pawn on the F file or the king moving away because then black loses. So the king had to protect the pawn. Check. The, the, the white rook tries to push the king further away from defending c4. Rook again attacks the same pawn. Bobby pushes the pawn forwards. Disaster. Now, if this guy were to take, I suspect the other pawn just simply moving uh, down the board here. Bishop c5. He got really, really... I think that was the blunder. I think this was the blunder moment. So apparently the correct move here would have been... Well, there's no correct move after the f3 is gone. Let me just go back a bit. So... Okay, so what should white play here? So, uh, rook h, no. Uh, it is, whose turn is now? White's turn. Right, okay, so what's the recommendation for this one? Rook to d, rook to h1 to try and uh, give you, uh, to try and maintain some possible checks. There's no good move. Everything go, goes down the pipe now. There's nothing good. Uh, bishop c5 for white, I mean, trying to stop the pawn from advancing. Now rook takes. Now probably Bobby was relieved because now the rook can just freely roam the board. Rook takes, but that's it. It's the end of it now. It's the end of it. Uh, yeah, yeah. And now he pushed the pawn uh, to the second rank and now Spassky just simply resigned. Okay, there is no way for them... There is no way for them to survive those three pawns backed by the black rook. So what are the things? Rook to f4, rook to f4, to which rook sacrifices itself on d4, rook takes d4, and then king to g2, rook g4, king f3, and the game continues with the pawn being promoted. So at this point now, Spassky simply resigned. And that was a very intense game, boys and girls, that happened in 1972 World Chess Championship. Robert James Fisher versus Boris Paskey. And at the end of it, Bobby was crowned world champion. So, guys, that was an incredibly complex game, which probably, I don't know how many minutes it took me uh, to talk about. But I'm pretty sure there is at least 100 times more uh, uh, meaningful ideas that uh, uh, could have been added to the thoughts that already have been expressed but hey just trying to make it short meaningful and uh, uh you know insightful to whatever extent i might be capable of so guys thanks very much uh, give me some messages like it if you enjoyed it in the slightest subscribe if you uh, would uh, like more uh, chess videos uh, on this channel